We are Acrisure. 14,000 experts around the world using game-changing technology to unlock an extraordinary advantage in insurance, real estate services, cyber services, asset management, and more. We are the high-tech human approach to help protect and grow everything you've worked so hard to build. It's nice to meet you. Find out what Acrisure can do for you at Acrisure.com. What's up, everyone? We're finally here. Welcome to the Roto Grinders NFL First Look Podcast. I'm Justin Carlucci here with TJ Lasig. What's up, TJ? It's good to have you on. I'm excited for the season. Justin, how's it going? It's it's been a long time coming, and part of me feels like it, it's not even real yet. I can't believe we're we're kicking off football in just a few short days here. Really excited to get into the season, and I mean, one of those where we're just grateful to have a season. So it's gonna be gonna be fun. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to finally work with you. We've been having our hands full here at RG with all the sports going on and, and the chaos. I'm, I'm kind of like one leg in NBA, one leg out of NBA now as, as things are winding down. And what have you been up to at RG, TJ? Yeah, I've been mostly focusing on golf over the past couple of, of weeks and months here. So that's been, been my primary focus working over there with STL cards and Noto and Tambo and those guys. So Excited to, to get into some NFL here, too. Dabbled in the NBA two-game slates and stuff. Not, that's just, I don't know, just not for me. I, I'm excited to have, have NFL back and have something that we can really dive into here. For sure. Give TJ a follow on Twitter at TJL5124DFS. That's TJ on Twitter. And it's, it's kind of hard to believe NFL is finally here. There were so many doubts, you know, doubts with every sport college football has been in limbo and and things like that and it, all signs are indicating that the NFL is a full go I'm sure after week one we'll have some kind of news and there'll be some kind of positive test or something something will happen but but for now you know we haven't had any any more recent COVID news which is great and things like that and we have a full slate of games here and we're going to pretty much talk about the main slate on Sunday but maybe the best game of the week is Thursday at 8 20 when the Texans take on Kansas City and TJ Deshaun Watson got paid yes indeed yes indeed he did and I mean I think rightfully so right he's been been showing that he's one of the the top quarterbacks most dynamic quarterbacks in the league for a couple years here it'll be interesting to see how he fares without Hopkins anymore I think that's a an interesting dynamic to follow throughout the season that along with with Will Fuller and uh, people love to talk about Will Fuller's health so It'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what what that void looks like with Hopkins target share no longer there. But yeah, a little bit of a bummer that that game's not on on the main slate. I think it's got the highest total on the board and one of the more fantasy friendly games. But it'll also be a great way to kick off the season. I'm sure there will be tons of Thursday showdown action as well. Yep, yep, and we'll have a, sh- a Thursday showdown a show on Roto Grinders for you guys, and that's going to be a great way to kick off the season. And there may be not a more set of injury prone receivers and having Brandon Cooks and, and Will Fuller on the same team. And of course, David Johnson and, and Bill O'Brien's on the hot seat. I mean, that thing is scolding Bill O'Brien and just, you know, the moves he's made and how, well, the influence he's had on some of those transactions. And, and we'll see how, uh, how, how Houston fares week one, Kansas city, nine point favorites, you know, high total there. So, uh, we'll let the rest of the RG team kind of fill you in on, on the Thursday showdown slate. There's a ton of, of loaded prize pools on, on both sites for Thursday showdown. So that'll definitely be fun. But let's kick off the main slate, baby, where we're finally here. A uh, bunch of one o'clock games, TJ. Seattle and Atlanta, I'm looking at a one and a half point favorite, the Seahawks are. And what's the total on that one? What do you see? What do you got over there? 49, I believe. 49. One of the higher totals uh, yeah. of the day. So I guess just what's your initial thoughts on that game? You know, what comes to mind first? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one to start off with because I think this actually might be one of the the best fantasy games of the week just with the high total and the tight spread like we talked about. 49 total, Seattle minus one and a half. And it's two offenses where I feel like the the target shares are pretty – condensed right on on the Seattle side of things obviously you have Russ leading the charge uh he's he's 
probably one of my favorite quarterback plays of the week. Definitely like the idea of a, of a game stack here with Russ and pairing him with either DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett. Because like I said, the, the, the targets are pretty condensed on that offense to those two. And then Chris Carson at running back as well pops as another nice play. I know all year, last year, we wanted to target running backs against Atlanta. I'm sure that that trend will likely hold going into this season. And there's there's not a ton of competition there for Carson. What, what's he got? Carlos Hyde behind him. I mean, I, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of Chris Carson. And then on the other side of things, you've got Ryan and Julio and Calvin Ridley leading that offense. And then I think on DraftKings, Hayden Hurst is going to be a, a pretty popular, cheap tight end play at only – 4,300, obviously coming coming over in the offseason from Baltimore. Austin Hooper no longer with Atlanta. So I, I think if we saw Austin Hooper at 4,300 in this spot, people would be all over him. So I expect no different with Hayden Hurst in this new offense. So, Man, it's 2020 and we're talking Hayden Hurst in week one. <laughs> you got to love it. Who would have thought? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russell Wilson, second most expensive quarterbacks on uh, both sites, FanDuel and DraftKings. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of chance for a lot of fantasy points in this game. Good point on uh, the target shares. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a little partial to Metcalf if I'm picking between him or Lockett. I, you know, or you could stack both. You know, there are plenty of options here. I'm um, just looking at the quarterback matchups. Um, you know, he has a, a pretty significant speed advantage on, on some of those corners who we should see a lot. Uh, what's interesting, you know, Seattle made some news. They did re-sign Josh Gordon, I believe, a couple days ago, right? So he's, that is correct. he's back. I, don't, I mean, who knows what his impact's going to be. You know, talk about one of the strangest roller coaster rides of the decade is the Josh Gordon experience. But, um, yeah, I like that game a lot. And Chris Carson, yeah, it just feels like every year there's, like, a mess in that backfield where there's a red flag with somebody's health, whether it was him or whether it was, like, Rashard Penny, which was a, a strange first-round pick a couple years ago. But Carson, just, you know, when he's healthy, I, he's probably one of the most underrated backs in the league, I think. And yeah, I mean, uh, Atlanta, I think gives up a lot of receptions to those tailbacks. So especially on DK and, uh, you know, Carson's not a guy who typically catches a lot of balls, but he, you know, could see a little bit more action there. So it should be a wild game there. And, and yeah, the obvious, the obvious names on the other side of the ball, um, you know, no Devonte Freeman anymore. And I just saw that he, uh, he met with, was it Jacksonville or something? And they couldn't figure out a deal. And, I was thinking, like, man, if, if you're Devontae Freeman, you should just be trying to get on the field at this point with somebody, right? So was- yeah, I know. It's it's surprising to see. It's it's funny how quickly some of these running backs can can turn. I mean, two years ago, Freeman was like a fantasy superstar, and now he can't even can't even get onto the Jacksonville Jaguars and work out a deal with them. So yeah, that's right. I didn't even mention Gurley. I, yeah, I'm just I'm just not sure on Gurley. Honestly, I think there's so many question marks with. What's his workload going to be? Can he stay healthy? Are they going to really treat him as a workhorse? I've seen some, you know, random Brian Hill buzz. Like, I don't know. I could just see Atlanta just going with some some random Brian Hill, Edo Smith, and I, I don't know. But, again, Gurley is another guy that two, two years ago is, is the number one fantasy running back. So, I don't know that I love him in general this year, but – I wouldn't hate hate anyone for wanting to go in that direction. Right. I mean, you want to talk about a, a super tournament play on a full slate of games on a Sunday, right? I mean, you, that, that's Todd Gurley. If you're, if you're yeah. playing large, you know, large field GPPs, you know, Gurley's going to come in super low probably. If you're playing one optimal lineup, I'm not, you know, I'm not running to play Gurley either, you know. But, yeah, you're, you're pre- I, 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 we're going to take a wait and see, I think, on Gurley. You know, see what happens. Yeah. A couple weeks ago, he was, like, limping off the practice field or whatever. Who knows how significant it was. But any any flag is a red one with Gurley kind of at this point. And who knows? I mean, could the guy go for 20 yards, uh, 20 carries, 100 yards, and two scores? Yeah, maybe. Sure, you know. But, um, you know, there's plenty of other ways to go in that game. My question to you is, do you, without preseason, are you kind of leaning on, like, teams that run more or, or like, kind of the guys who have been like, quarterbacks and receivers who've had chemistry in game situations? Or, you know, like, what's your take on kind of not having any preseason and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's definitely a unique situation that we've never had before, right? We don't have training camps or full training camps to point towards. We don't have any preseason games to point towards. So, I think – and there's – quite a few new situations across the board. So I would definitely prefer, especially in 
like cash game optimal smaller field type things to focus on situations where we we've seen it before from last year so you know trying to avoid maybe some of the situations where there's a new quarterback wide receiver connection just taking the wait and see approach there and I mean that's part of the reason why I like this game in particular because for the most part we've seen this before aside from the Hayden Hurst thing but that that's and Todd Gurley, that's not going to make a big difference on those offenses. But, yeah, and I think in general with week one, like, in general, we don't know much. And so that is even escalated to a, a further extent this year with the lack of information. So I think it's a, a great week to go a little bit contrarian and, and try to avoid some of the group think that I'm sure will make its way into the industry over the next couple of days because, you know, nobody really knows a ton right now. And anything could happen comes on to anything else from this Seattle Atlanta game or, or should we move on here? No, I think it's a, a great game to target in, in all formats. And uh, I think we're good on that one. Maybe a game that's on the opposite side of the spectrum is the Jets and the Bills, a good old AFC East grinder total of 39 and a half right now. I think the Bills are six and a half point favorites. Uh, Stefan Diggs making his way to Buffalo. I, I saw somebody tweet, earlier I don't remember who it was but they were like can't wait to see Josh Allen do Josh Allen things this weekend so uh let's see what Josh Allen can do with his new toy you know taking on the Jets here Sam Darnold uh is back you know, hopefully no more mono for him this year um and this is just you know a game that I we I know we talked a little bit before the show probably won't be targeting a ton of plays from maybe a defense here or there you know you see the low total but what do you think about this one TJ yeah, it's definitely an ugly one from a fantasy perspective. Anytime you're getting a total under 40 points, there's just not a lot of upside to be had there. Uh, I think, you know, J- Josh Allen alone brings upside to the table almost any week. So almost a, a, a naked Josh Allen type of play just because he can get it done with the legs and He's shown that in the past that that at any time he can go off for 25, 30 fantasy points. But, yeah, the, the Diggs one is kind of exactly what I was just talking about. I want to take a wait-and-see approach there just because I'm not sure what kind of chemistry we're going to have between Allen and Diggs. Obviously, Diggs is a great player, but uh, just not really chopping at the bit to, to, to jump on anyone on this game. And then with the Bills running back situation, I think – We'll expect Singletary to be the go-to guy to to start the season, but I think long-term I'm a little bit more bullish on Zach Moss, and he's somebody that I've been targeting in in things like best ball. So the whole thing just just feels like an avoid to me. And Le'Veon Bell's not really appealing to me anymore. There's just not a lot to love in this game. Is there anything you're seeing that that you can get behind? Not really. I mean, you make a good point for, like, annual leagues, you know. Um, Zach Moss, one of these guys in this rookie running back class that are really intriguing. Um, Josh Allen, a guy who has really struggled with deep ball accuracy as it is. Now he's got to get in tune with uh, with Diggs with a new receiver. And, you know, you can play in camp and you can scrimmage, but it's just not the same, right, as that in-game. I know there's, like, no fans in any of the stadiums, but when you – it's just – you can get some rhythm down in camp, but it's just not the same when, you know, with the in-game situation. So I'm probably going to pass. Um, naked Josh Allen's interesting. You know, I'm sure some people will play naked Lamar Jackson um, and stuff like that too. I mean, could you go into GPP and kind of play naked Josh Allen kind of thing in a large field, you know, like thousands, maybe a million entries or whatever in these crazy millies or something? Yeah, I mean, I think you could, but I don't, I don't think you have to by right. any means. <laughs> right. It just feels like one of those games where we're trying to, to force it. And, I mean, I think the easiest thing to do is just X this game off your list as you're going through. And, I mean, I find it, you know, you're, you're not going to look back on Monday and be like, oh, man, I'm, I'm so upset that I faded the, the Bills-Jets game. It just seems highly unlikely. None of these guys are going to come in at ownership anyways. And uh, Yeah. Let me tell you something about Naked, and I know you probably have no idea where this thing's going, but Manscaped TM redesigned their electric trimmer, and this thing is badass. They spent 18 months perfecting this new thing. You know, Manscaping is something you got to take serious. Everyone makes mistakes. Josh Allen makes a ton of mistakes, you know, um, but you want to talk about some upside. Go get some Manscaped TM. You know, this, this thing's the real deal. Um, get 20% off and free shipping, promo code, 
Roto, R-O-T-O, at manscaped.com. A lot of good technology there. Manscaped TM. Head on over there. Get 20% off free shipping. Promo code ROTO, R-O-T-O, at manscaped.com. Anyway, let's move on here. That, that was not a fun game. You know, you're going to see a ton of single-digit ownerships, and rightfully so. It's, it's going to be one of those slugfests, you know, those gritty divisional games. But, yeah, I'm with you. I'm not really going to have a, a ton of exposure here. You know, if you're, like, 150 max and something, and, you, you know, you have some uh, a few shares of a guy here or there, like, you know, uh, a couple big shares or something like that. But I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm not uh, really on that game much at all. Uh, next on the list here is Chicago and Detroit. Mitchell Trubisky is uh, the starting quarterback for the Bears. I guess I'm not shocked. I guess you got to give the kid uh, some kind of opportunity, but it just feels like uh, – like to me, it just feels like, okay, you got like three weeks and, and we're bringing in Nick Foles, right? Like I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think here. What's your thought on this game? Obviously, David Montgomery's uh, banged up, so that was one of the bigger stories on the Chicago side of the ball. And if you're thinking PPR and Tariq Cohen, and I was pretty excited about, about maybe Nick Foles uh, because he checks down to running backs a lot. So I was kind of thinking, okay, like Tariq Cohen, um, but he might see some more opportunity, you know, uh, Tariq Cohen here, Anthony Miller came on the end of last season. So and Alan Robinson, can we get this guy a quarterback before he's out of his prime? Uh, the, the guy's an unreal route runner here. Uh, what do you think? Chicago, Detroit, bare side of the ball here, TJ. Yeah, I think the the Cohen situation is probably going to be one of the more interesting ones for this first week. I, I imagine that he's going to become pretty chalky just because there's not really much else going on in that back, backfield with Montgomery out. Cohen, obviously great for PPR purposes, but if he's also going to get some early down work with Montgomery out, I think that, you know, 4,900 for Cohen – will then allow you to get up to the, the McCaffrey's, the Camaras. So I could see him becoming a, a popular play and, and with good, I think, good reason too. So he's probably one of my favorite value plays on the board, which, uh, and again, I think he'll be chalky too, but sometimes it's worth just eating the chalk there. And then, yeah, the, the Trubisky full situation, it just feels very, very, very fragile, very tenuous. I, I think, like you said, it's almost like a formality giving it to Trubisky to start knowing that, you know, he, he's probably not going to do well. But, I mean, he, he can put up some fantasy games. So I, I don't really hate going with like a Trubisky, Cohen, Allen Robinson type of stack here. You could bring it back with Galladay on the other side. So I think there's some, some sneaky fantasy upside in this game. In general, uh, like you said, you, me- you mentioned Anthony Miller. He had some some big games down the stretch last season. He's a little bit more expensive than I would like at at five k. But uh, yeah, Ro- I mean Robinson's just a great talent. It's just a shame that he can't have someone that can get him the ball. But yeah, I think on the Chicago side, it's it's Cohen, it's Robinson. You could throw Trubisky in there for for tournaments, and then heading to the other side of the ball, Galladay think is a had a breakout year last year just a an overall talent he can he can do it all from a wide receiver perspective Marvin Jones as well kind of like their their passing game a decent bit but the running game for Detroit a bit of a mess here <laughs> bringing in Adrian Peterson so uh yeah I mean I, I don't know I, I think that that whole running game is a wait and see until DeAndre Swift can hopefully take over later in the season yeah, and uh, that that should hopefully be some nice ROI for the annual season drafters who who took a chance on Swift. <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, like how much does Detroit dislike Carry on Johnson? I think it's like a fourteen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> right? it has to be. Like, come on, you're bringing in Adrian Peterson, and my my read on that situation is that by the end of the year, DeAndre Swift will be the guy. Maybe they're not ready to jump to him right off the bat from week one. And so they trust Carryon Johnson so little that they have to bring in Adrian Peterson to to help them out in that early season as as Swift gets up to speed. So yeah, they really just don't like him. I mean, uh, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. It is crazy. Get on over there to Roto Grinders, folks. Our premium tools are are really second to none in the industry. We have so many articles, podcasts, but the tools. I mean, Lineup HQ, 
Gridiron HQ. We're top of the line, folks. I mean, there's just so much to analyze. Uh, you can spend hours uh, going through whatever you want uh, in a good way. I mean, there's so much, so many directions you can go, but it's easily accessible. And if you're in a time crunch, I mean, Lineup HQ is is so accommodating. It's so user friendly. Check this stuff out. Um, this this is a sneaky game, and I'm with you on Cohen. Uh, probably on DraftKings, right? More than FanDuel with the full yeah. point per catch. Uh, but I mean, I don't hate it on FanDuel. I just think there, you know there's some other directions to go there. Obviously, um, you know, new newer listeners, the FanDuel's half point per catch. DK is the full the full shebang there, one point per reception. So uh, Cohen is often pretty popular when the situation is right for him on DK. But yeah, I mean, Trubisky has some games. Wasn't wasn't it Thanksgiving when they played last year and uh, Trubisky had like three touchdowns and Galladay went off in the same game? It was uh, a crazy little game stack for that tiny slate there. So. Um, it could happen. And Galladay's one of those guys on this gigantic slate where people are probably like, wow, the Bears matchup is like nothing I'm going out of my way for. It'll probably drive down his ownership, right? Because there's a lot of receivers in good spots. But, you know, we know his upside. And he has a pretty high floor and pretty much any upside at this point. And Matt Stafford seemed to got a lot of buzz as like the most underrated quarterback in the league kind of this offseason. And he was having a pretty good year last year. And so I do like Galladay for GPPs um, and things like that. But, yeah, I'm with you on Cohen. I think we're kind of on the same page there. So uh, anything else from the Bears-Lions, TJ? No, I think that's really it. I mean, I guess the one other person to mention in general is TJ Hawkinson. Hawkinson yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm bullish on him, I think, long-term from a, a season-long perspective. Not sure I necessarily am – loving going there this week in particular but I think he's someone to, to keep on our radar and evaluate because he, he showed some some upside and some potential yeah. last year and I, I think that he's again just someone to keep on a, on our radar as we go forward yeah we we saw his we saw his upside last year he was so frustrating to roster you know has a big week you know then next week's just totally uninvolved you know like come on Matt Patricia what's what's yeah. going on over there man um, but yeah, Hawkins, I'm looking at our ownership projections here on, on um, our G lineup HQ and Hawkins is under 10%. We know, we know, we know his ceiling, we know his upside. So uh, yeah, good call TJ. Let's move on here. Let's see. Next game we got Green Bay, Minnesota, two teams that know each other pretty well. Dalvin Cook, you know, his situation, we thought maybe he'd be holding out. Looks like the contract talks have kind of halted, but as far as we know, he's, he's uh, all systems go for Sunday. Obviously, life after Stefan Diggs in Minnesota, which I think is going to be a huge blow for them. Uh, I know they brought in uh, Justin Jefferson, but we'll see how long it takes for him to get acclimated. Diggs accounted for a ton of Kirk Cousins' uh, quote-unquote deep passing yards, and I, I think that's going to be tough to, to replace, especially early in the season before – uh, someone like Jefferson gets up to speed, you know, because you got Thielen, who's more of, you know, the route running chain chain mover. Um, so I, I'm interested to see what Minnesota really looks like. Obviously, you can run the ball in Green Bay. So we know Cook is as healthy as far as we know, probably the healthiest he'll be all year, maybe in week one. So I do have definitely tournament interest in Cook. I'm willing to pay for him in some situations if if I can find the right pieces around him. And you know, Green Bay was kind of one of the stories of the draft and kind of what the hell are you doing, Matt LaFleur? You know, bringing in Jordan Love, uh, and then A.J. Dillon comes in. Uh, we know Aaron Jones is on the last year of his contract, and Aaron Jones is a baller. But maybe Green Bay just doesn't want to pay for him. And, of course, you got Jamal Williams just lingering there, too, who becomes relevant every other week. So you want to talk about another messy run game in the, uh, in the NFC North there, you know, the trio of backs in Green Bay, obviously it's, it's Jones is going to be the you know, early down guy, you would think. Who, who knows with Matt LaFleur, you know. Um, and uh, really, they got no no help for, for Aaron Rodgers this offseason, which everybody's scratching their heads. But I do like Devontae Adams. I do. You know, he's performed in this matchup the last couple of years. So uh, he's a guy I'm kind of looking at, too. And in that price range, there might be – uh, you know, a lot of people go in different directions. So I do think Adams is, is definitely relevant in GPPs. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think when it comes to wide receivers, outside of Michael Thomas, Adams is about as much guaranteed volume as you're going to get on a, 
on a weekly basis. I mean, he's pretty much a lock for 10 plus targets just because they've got no one else to throw to. Um, so, I mean, for, for, for that reason, I'm, I'm not really like, I don't really love Rogers because I'd rather just play Adams as a one-off because it's really, it's really where all the, the targets and all the volume is going to go to uh, the, yeah, the green Bay running back situation just, going to be interesting to see how they they make it work with all three of those obviously Aaron Jones is going to be the lead dog but maybe he he gets his snap counts cut a bit by Jamal and and AJ Dillon Dalvin agree with you there it's been an interesting offseason for him but he of course brings that that upside to the table multiple touchdown upside so like like him I think in general, a lot of these guys are more more GPP type plays for me, yep. just because there's a lot of uncertainty. And yeah, I mean Adam Thielen, he, he he's a little bit expensive, but it, the thing with the Vikings used to be condensed target share, share between Thielen and Diggs, and, and now there's no more Diggs. So, uh, although I'm not sure if that's going to help or hurt Thielen, because right. they'll be able to to focus on him more. So it'll be interesting to see if a potential increased target share, but more attention to him from a defensive perspective helps or hurts Thielen. So I could see going to him, but that's also a situation that, that I'll be monitoring early in the season. Yeah, and I'm interested to see what Green Bay does against Thielen. Uh, Jerry Alexander shadowed Diggs once last year, and I think Alexand- Alexander's a good cornerback. And I'm pretty sure there was four or five or six – maybe six, four, at least four other games where Jay Alexander shadowed the other team's you know, best primary wide receiver. So it might be, uh, you know, worth digging in if you're interested in Adam Thielen, kind of just seeing what the beat writers are saying, if you can get any intel throughout the week. And uh, Alexander, in my opinion, is head and shoulders above the other corners on the Green Bay roster there. Um, and, yeah, Adams, I mean, that Minnesota secondary is just – isn't isn't very good you know Adam should see a good chunk of of Holton Hill um and a little bit of Mike Hughes who doesn't scare me and I think Cam Dantzler they drafted I think he runs like a four six so there's nothing I mean you know you can try to double Devontae if you want but I don't I still don't think the coverage is going to be very good there and you're right out of sheer volume alone and you know that's uh that's the red zone guy there for Green Bay but I'm with you you know for me not really a very stackable game, but definitely some one-off pieces. You know, I wouldn't hate you for playing some of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think just to reiterate, I think Adams is my favorite play yeah. in this game. And I mean, maybe even one of the, the best wide receiver plays on the board. I mean, he's 1700 cheaper than Michael Thomas, which is kind of crazy. That's yeah. a lot of a lot of savings off of Thomas. Obviously, Thomas is in a we'll get them eventually is in a much better game environment. But I think that from a, a point per dollar perspective, taking that discount on Adams is is something that you can go to in any of your contests. But like you said, I'm not not really loving this game from a stackability perspective. But I like taking a, a one off piece because there's going to be scoring. It's just not clear, you know, if it's going to be. Uh, enough of a spread around to, to stack the game. Right. A lot of unknowns this week. We'll, we'll get some answers next week for sure. Moving on here. Miami and New England. Fitzpatrick was named the starting quarterback on Labor Day. So the Fitzpatrick saga will continue. It's not going to be Tua, at least not from the get-go. Miami, a team that has made a lot of roster moves and a lot of changes during uh, the 2020 offseason here. Matt Breida coming to town. Uh, they paid Jordan Howard to come on in. Uh, and you kind of had an emerging Preston Williams. And who are we finally getting Devontae Parker? Like, I, I don't know. It's, it's hard to buy in. You know, Devontae Parker is finally, like, coming out of his shell six years too late kind of thing. We thought we'd, we'd get out of him a couple years ago. But who knows? I mean, we know Fitzpatrick's going to sling it. We just don't know what color jersey the ball's going to go to sometimes. So, uh, and on New England, obviously, Cam Newton, you know, kind of a late signing by Bill Belichick. A lot of people kind of had their finger on this and thought he's got to be going in New England or, or maybe San Diego or something. Like, there's no way they're going to roll in with Jared Stidham as quarterback, right? So here's Cam Newton taking over 
obviously never played with the Patriots, all brand new, not a great receiving corpse there. You know, Julian Edelman. Um, I just th- – that there's a lot of unknown on that Patriot side of the ball too, which is um, hard to want to do anything, especially – we covered two ugly mess of, of a tailback situation. The Patriots are, are another one, you know, Sony Michelle, James White, you know, Burkhead's still there. I think Damian Harris is hurt. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, they did no. cut Lamar Miller yesterday, like two days after I saw a report saying he's pushing for carries and he just gets cut. So I, I don't know. This, this game for me is probably going to be a lot of uh, red red light and, and look the other way kind of thing with all the other options on the court. Yeah, agreed. I, I had this one and the the Bills game that we talked about as the two that were like kind of a, a void from a fantasy perspective. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick will forever be in my heart from like the game three years ago when he threw for six touchdowns or whatever it was. I, I remember being – on him at like minimum price on Fandle that week. And I'll, I'll always love him for that one, but, but I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not looking to go back to him in 2020, but uh, yeah. And I mean, it's more just, I'll be interested to see what this new England team looks like under Cam Newton and where that target distribution will go. But like you said, the running back situation as it pretty much always is in new England is, is a bit of a mess. You know, there's always Julian Edelman, but uh, I'm going to take a wait and see approach there with with Cam and, and Edelman, and yeah, it's just not it's just not a lot to love here. Nikhil Harry will be another person to, to keep our eye on, right? More more longer term throughout this season, but yeah, I think it's another game where you know you don't need to force it. There's 12 games on the main slate, and I think we're we're better off spending our time looking elsewhere. Agreed, agreed. And every year, every year there's more and more running back by committees and less and less workhorse running backs. And obviously the league has shifted to a passing league, you know, uh, years ago, I mean, early two thousands, you're doing your annual drafts. You saw the three running back strategy, boom, boom, boom. First three rounds, you know, every other team was doing it just cause that's, that's what the league was, you know, uh, plenty of workhorses back then things are changing and they want fresh legs. You, you need to be able to catch the ball in the backfield. And, you know, Jordan Howard, I mean, he's, he's capable, but he doesn't have great hands, but they brought in Burita. And we're talking season-long leagues. I mean, you could use these guys for bi-week fillers, and every once in a while they'll have some upside. But New England's defense is good, you know. And Miami's defense, they drafted they drafted a couple corners, brought in some corners. Like, Miami's trying to sure up the back end there, too. So that makes me, like, like Cam even less, you know, that Miami kind of shored things up a little bit there. But let's move on. Let's move on here to – uh, the Eagles and the Washington football team. So we got an over-under of 43, and uh, the Eagles are the favorites here. Philly, you know, I'm from PA up here, TJ. Are you from PA? I, I am as well, yeah. Are you okay. Philly guy? I'm well, about an hour and a half north of Philly. Okay. All right. So, so you know Philly sports radio, and we, we know oh, – yeah. Can't even turn it on sometimes. And are you an Eagles guy or no? Yeah, yeah, I'm an Eagles fan. Okay, okay. So I'll I'll just turn it over to you right now. Talk to me about this <laughs> game and and where do you think? And I will tell you that I am like seriously considering maybe a little game stack here and in, in one of my lineups. That's that's I'm on the same page there. And I mean, my hope was that it was going to be a little bit sneaky to do so. I think, but the totals over under is only 43, which. I, I thought seemed a little light. I mean, I just feel like, I mean, I, I like, I like Wentz. I, I still think mm-hmm. that Wentz is a good quarterback. Uh, some people maybe do not agree with that take, but I mean, I think from both a, a real life football perspective and from a fantasy perspective, I think he is just a good quarterback. And with no Alshon Jeffrey, no Jalen Rieger. I think we see a, a pretty condensed target share again with Philly between Ertz, Deshaun Jackson. I mean, really, that's it. And Miles Sanders. Although, one thing that we'll need to keep an eye on is the Miles Sanders injury situation. It sounds like he's going to play, but he's also been limited recently in practice. So that gives me a little bit of pause. But I mean, if it weren't for that, Miles Sanders would maybe be my favorite running back play on the entire slate because I just I'm bullish on him long term as a talent this is not Eagles bias coming to play I just I genuinely think that he's going to have a a great year and a a great couple of years ahead here 
So, I mean, I, I, yeah, I like Wentz. I like Sanders. I like Deshaun Jackson. And I like Zach Ertz. And I think that you can stack up the Eagles in that way and, and run it back with Terry McLaurin. He's another oh, guy yeah. that, that I like. Again, heavy on him in best ball, season long, things like that. I um, think he provides great value and has a nice combination of a floor and upside here. So I'm with you. I think this is a, a nice sneaky game stack spot and something that, that I'm going to be looking to target with one of my lineups. Terry's good. The kid's good. But, but let's address one of the other elephants in the room here. What's the deal with Antonio Gibson? What's your take on him? Oh, yeah. G- great, great question. Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not – yeah, like is he gonna emerge as the the chalk value or it's possible? It's very, po- it's very possible. I, see, I I need to look into this one more. I'll, I'll be honest, but just off the cuff, it seems like it could that could be one of those like bad chalk spots. But I mean, at only four thousand, you don't need a right. ton from him, right? And it's um, like like hypothetical game flow, you know, kind of thing. It's like okay, like Washington's trailing and. Check down. There's check down city, you know. Um, and I'm not an Eagles guy, but and, I, and I'm saying I, I do like the Eagles this week, so I'm not. You're not getting any bias from here, but I, they were kind of one of my first looks. And you know, Miles Sanders. Can the Eagles get a break? I mean, as much as I dislike the Eagles from like a fan perspective, they need to catch a break. It's the first week, and they're still not healthy, right? Like I, I, I feel bad for. I have a million friends that are fans. You know, you're my new friend, TJ, and you're a fan, yeah. and. I mean, Alshon, come on. I mean, God, he just can't stay healthy. And now uh, Sanders is dinged up. And per dollar, he's probably my favorite play on the board, too, especially on DK when you get that reception bonus. And um, you know, we're spoiled being here in PA because we got to see Miles Sanders at Penn State. We got to see Barkley at Penn State. I actually saw Barkley play in high school once, which was just – I was like, who is this kid? He's just doing things on the field that, that nobody else is doing, you know, Whitehall Zephyr over there in, in the Lehigh Valley. But – I'm hoping Miles Sanders is healthy, you know, even if he's like 90%, I'm, I'm ready to roster him. Uh, does it frustrate you that good old Doug really loves his committees? You know, does that worry you at all with like Boston Scott getting some, a, a couple carries or anything like that? Yeah. See, I, I think that, I think he's been more of a committee guy because he's never had someone as talented as Sanders. At, at least that's kind of my hope here. I, I I think that Sanders can be more of a workhorse going into this season. I think Boston Scott certainly will be that change of pace type back. Maybe he gets some run on third down type situations, but I think we'll see mostly Sanders again, health permitting. It's a little bit of a question mark this week. Maybe we we don't get a a full snap count from Sanders, but yeah, I'm I'm looking more into this Gibson situation right now. And he, he might just have to be that, that play at 4k I mean it's even 900 cheaper than Cohen and there's not a ton else that's going to be going on in the the Washington backfield so that's one that we'll continue to monitor but yeah it it frees up a lot of cap space so I think it's something that that we'll have to look into yeah I I think you'll see some people go there you'll have some people go with Tariq Cohen for sure um you know, in just terms of like value running backs, especially on DK. I think, I think Gibson is 4,600 on FanDuel. So he's dirt cheap over there too. Yeah. Definitely keep an eye on, you know, his ownership projections, go over there, check out our RG premium tools. Uh, you know, just to touch on uh, Deshaun Jackson, uh, just kind of looking at our receiver cornerback matchups over here, just another great feature we have on Roto Grinders. Um, you know, Deshaun will probably see, a lot of Kendall Fuller. Fuller played, I think, over two-thirds of his snaps in the slot last year, and he gave up the ninth most yards per route. And when Deshaun's been healthy, he's had, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's had a decent rapport with Carson, right? So um, I, I, I kind of like playing these two together in, in a tournament for sure. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I mean, I, I like Deshaun Jackson, and he's he's that perfect kind of – tournament play mold too where he just has that you know 60 yard touchdown upside <laughs> at every, any given moment and I think you know it, it, we're always looking for guys that obviously pricing comes out pretty early and he was priced as if Rieger is playing and mm-hmm. you know that that's not 
going to be the case anymore. And there's just not going to be a ton for once to be throwing to. So I, I like Jackson from that view. I, I'm sure he'll probably come with some ownership, but uh, so we'll, we'll have to kind of evaluate that ownership Deshaun. versus. Deshaun. Uh, yep. Yeah. I was going to say, he's like the ultimate best ball receiver, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. Him, him, Marquise Brown, those types where they have those spike games, those spike weeks. So always people that looking to target in a format like best ball or a format like uh, GPPs. You know, that 43 total might drive some people away from that game, right? Like maybe yeah. a little bit. So, I mean, you look at the team totals and what Philly's projected, what, 24 and change maybe or something like that. So it's not the worst, but... Yeah, maybe they're just taking account of some of the injuries. Maybe maybe the uncertainty with Miles Sanders right now, and maybe we'll see that creep up to like, you know, 44 and a half, maybe by Sunday. I, I don't know. I'm a little surprised it's, it's that low too. But uh, for now, I'm still um, definitely interested in, in a lot of uh, uh, fantasy value in that game. So uh, let's, let's move on here. If you're cool with that, we'll, uh, we'll check out the, the Raiders in Carolina. Do you have anything else on the Eagles game? Or are we good? Nope. I think we're good. Cool. I think, I think they understand that, that we like that game quite a bit. So <laughs> seems uh, that way. Yeah. So Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Raiders, that just sounds weird. And, and Carolina here, Teddy, Teddy Brid- Bridgewater, whatever his name is. I can't talk today. Taking over for the Panthers. Obviously you got McCaffrey, you got two great running backs on both sides of the ball in this game. Two of the more uh, workhorse quote unquote of 2020. Uh, and Josh Jacobs on the other side, and uh, the Raiders who took Henry Ruggs, you know, and everybody's like, okay. And we just saw uh, Tyrell Williams guy is out for the year. A couple days ago, we saw that unfortunate news. Uh, Derek Carr looks to be the man. Um, you know, they brought Mariota in, and, and I'm a Titans fan, so I'm pulling for you, Marcus. But I'm also glad that I don't have to read that in your like seventh year you're working on fundamental footwork, which drove me nuts. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like, obviously, you know, McCaffrey is going to carry a ton of ownership here. There's ways to get him this week, TJ, right. With, with the value and things like that. And, and Josh Jacobs, uh, fan duel, he's 8,200. So he's, he's priced up there. Uh, what is he at DK, uh, 68. So big, uh, price differential there. So what, what, what's your takeaways? You know, uh, Teddy Bridgewater, if there's Derek Carr and, uh, you know, a couple of really good running backs here. Yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting game. I mean, I think, I think with so much uncertainty in week one that McCaffrey is one of the few situations where you feel confident that he's going to get his. And, yeah, he's 10K on DraftKings and 10K on FanDuel as well. But I think you can make it work. And I think it's worth trying to make it work just because with so many unknowns. And I feel like in general, running back is the position where you want to take the guys that that you know and you're confident are going to have that locked-in workload and then look to differentiate elsewhere. So I'll be getting McCaffrey into my lineups. I just just think it's a slam dunk and worth worth paying for the, the raw points there and making it work with the rest of your lineup. Also like Josh Jacobs as well. Uh, Like you said, another situation where he's looking to be the workhorse here. I think the one potential knock on Jacobs is that maybe he's not going to get as much passing down work, but playing against Carolina, I think that's one of the the few spots where we'll see the Raiders be be a favorite this year. So game strip could be in his favor. And typically you don't want to play two running backs from opposite teams in the same lineup, but I think this is – an exception where where you can do that just because McCaffrey doesn't matter if they're up down he's going to get his so you could could see a game script where the Raiders go up Jacobs is is getting the ball and then McCaffrey's chasing from behind getting a lot of dump off so don't hate playing the two of them together and then as far as the passing games go I'm really bullish on DJ Moore in general for this season I just think I expect Carolina to be chasing a lot and expect that to result in a lot of, of DJ Moore targets. And, you know, I, I also, I like Curtis Samuel. I like Ian Thomas. For some reason, I keep finding myself on Carolina in things like best ball, but I, I think it's that reason. I think that they're going to be playing from behind a lot and there, there's going to be some garbage time points to be had for those folks. So 
Ian Thomas at 3,400 is an interesting punt tight end play on DraftKings. I think on, on FanDuel, it doesn't usually make sense to punt off at tight end, but on, on DraftKings, just from a roster construction standpoint, that often makes sense. So you can pay up for the guys like McCaffrey. So, yeah, I think it's really looking at the running backs here as the, the primary building blocks. And then there are some some passing game options you can look at, too. Yeah, and, and Carolina really struggled against the run. You know, at least yeah. they did last year. Uh, looking at a gridiron IQ tool, which is awesome. Carolina ranked bottom five in rushing yards and rushing success percentage last year. And they were second worst in the league in giving up runs of 10 plus yards. So right off the bat there, I mean, we're looking at three pretty big statistics that, you know, we're, Jacobs is, is going to get at least 15 carries if he's healthy, right? Like, so unless the game for some reason gets out of control early. So uh, I'm liking, you know, I don't know. He's, he's a little harder to pay for on FanDuel at 82. Obviously I like his, his price more in DK, but I'm still considering him. I think you can play him uh, on both sites. So I, I do like Jacobs. And you made a good point. You know, you don't typically want to play you know, two, running, two running backs, one on each team that are, are playing against each other. But this is kind of one of those uh, unique outlier situations here. Uh, good point on Carolina. They had such bad quarterback play last year that I actually looked into this in the offseason. Um, it, it was brutal. And you look at the, the difference, the discrepancy of, of air yards and actual yards, I think Curtis Samuel left a, just under 1,000 on the table. And I'm not saying Curtis Samuel's going to go off this year, but that, that's bad. That's a lot, you know? So uh, DJ Moore left, left a little bit on the table too. But, um, God, who's – I don't want to uh, – this is mean, but I was going to say, who's the scrub that was playing quarterback for them last year? Kyle, Kyle Allen. Kyle, Kyle Allen. Allen. Yeah. Kyle Allen. No offense, Kyle Allen. I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a scrub too. I mean, who am I to, to really say? But uh, it, it wasn't your best effort. Um, it was a little brutal. And, and DJ Moore, man, really coming into his own. I like to call. And it's a game flow thing. You know, throughout the year, you can deal with – you know, he, he, he had the same quarterback throwing him the ball too. And a lot of game script, you know, fit the mold of – playing from behind and and that's a good point um this might be one of those games where maybe, maybe they're not like super behind though right so um I, like you said I think that you could play both running backs for sure but yeah definitely some options in this game on, on both sides of the ball and uh, I do like Josh Jacobs and I probably will if I'm playing one or two optimal lineups on either side I'll probably try to get uh, McCaffrey from one of them um, yes, sir. Yeah, let's get going here. Uh, next game is good old AFC South banger, Indy and Jacksonville, who um, had a yard sale, had, you know, liquidation sale, got rid of everybody. And it just seems so long ago when they were in the AFC championship against the Steelers. But here we are, and it's uh, the Gardner Minshew show. I don't know who we're going to see at running back. I could have sworn I just saw before we get on here that um, Armstead had like COVID issues. Did you see anything about that? I I, I got to look into that. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that has been a thing. Oh man. Yeah, I mean, I think they're gonna, but I think he's gonna be able to play. Okay. I don't know. I mean, that's another situation where they're gonna have a three man kind of committee going on here. I mean, I just think that that's why you look at guys like McCaffrey and. Josh Jacobs that we just talked about and, you know, Kamara, Miles Sanders, guys that are going to get the workload at running back, I think are extremely valuable here. And I mean, when I'm building my lineups for the most part, I'm going to, going to try to lock in on a core group of running backs and then avoid all of these murky situations because, and we have two of them in here, right? In Indy, we've got, we've got Marlon Mack and Jonathan Taylor, and that's another situation similar to the Bills, where I expect by the end of the year, Jonathan Taylor to be the guy. But early on, we'll probably see them go to Marlon Mack. But they're just both cutting into each other's value so much that it's, it's hard to play either of them and, and see a ton of – it just feels like low floor, low upside yeah. scenarios. No, I, I agree. I was a little surprised when they drafted Taylor. I – uh, it, it, you know, caught me by surprise, but maybe that's, you know, they have a decent offensive line and actually pretty good offensive line. So maybe that's the identity they want to try to build with. Cause you know, by week four, T Y will have a hamstring issue. Probably pro- actually he might already have a slight one. I, I don't know. So 
maybe they just want to, you know, pound the ball. And you can do that against Jacksonville, but you're right. It just seems like a you know, low floor, you know, limited ceiling kind of thing because, you know, they can each get 10 carries and that's it. Like, who, who knows? It could be one of those weird situations. You know, Philip Rivers, another another a familiar face in a new situation, you know, hasn't had really any in-game situations with the Colts, obviously. So uh, maybe they will lean a little bit on the run game, but, you know, with a full slate of games and a lot of other guys and, and good opportunities. Um, and, it's, it, it, you know, my, my gut saying it's totally possible that it's like a Jonathan Taylor, 10 carry, 60 yard, two touchdown kind of like garbage game. Like it could happen. Like, I don't know, but like, I'm not going there. Right. We just, it's hard to go there when, you know, you're playing kind of, if you're playing optimally or something like that. But on the flip side of the ball, the Jaguars are, you know, obviously if, unless you've been under a rock this off season, you know, you know, they're getting rid of everybody, but I do like DJ shark in this game quite a bit, actually. What, what are your thoughts on the Jags? Anybody you're looking at here? Yeah, I think, I think shark is definitely the guy. Uh, he showed a lot of promise last year. Him and Minshew seem to have some, some pretty decent chemistry going on and he would definitely be, the person that I'm looking to on the, the Jacksonville side of the football, maybe maybe even the only person on the Jacksonville side. Right, right. Uh, now, now that I'm looking at it, I mean, yeah, I think you can use him as a as a one off. I mean, if you if you want to do like a Rivers Hilton, DJ Chark, you can. It'll it'll be low owned, but I, I'm not entirely sold on the upside there. But yeah. I think Chark is is a solid play and, and will be probably all year. I mean, Jacksonville's always going to be an underdog. They're always going to be playing from behind and they don't have a ton of options. So I think you'll see Chark get a lot of targets and uh, he, he has the ability to, to break out for some big plays and some big games. So that's where I'm at on him. I, I agree. I think he's the best option by far on the Jacksonville side. Yeah. The, the, it could be a brutal game, you know? So, like, you just – everybody has yeah, to – Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'm surprised that this is a 45 – like, this is a two-point higher total than the Philly game. Which yeah. It's surprising to me. Like, where are the 45 points going to come from when you're looking at this list of names? But maybe that's the problem is that they're, they're going to be so spread out. Like, uh, Jonathan Taylor gets a touchdown. Marlon Mack gets a touchdown. Like, I just – I don't know. I, I'm having a tough time putting my finger on this game. Just feels like an ugly one in general. Yeah, those AFC South games typically are. We're covering a lot of ground here on the main slate. There's a ton of Thursday showdown contests over there on DraftKings. Draft six players from the season opening game. Stay under the salary cap and just kind of see how your team stacks up against some of the best players in the world, some casual players. There's Many different types of entry fees, you know, different types of games. Play what you're comfortable playing. Plenty of opportunities to win. If you go over there on DraftKings, you know, download the app in the App Store. Use your code DFF and you will receive a free shot at the $1 million top prize with your first deposit. Nothing adds to the sweat of watching the game like having a shot at a $1 million payday. So, maybe that won't come... (laughs) You know, maybe the Millie won't, it won't come with a lot of exposure to the Jacksonville Indy game. But uh, let, let's move on. You've got a couple games left before we got to get out of here for the afternoon. So where are we at here? Oh, big one, you know, Cleveland and Baltimore. We talked about naked Josh Allen before. I'm sure you'll see some uh, naked Lamar Jackson lines throughout the industry on both sites. Obviously, you compare him with a guy like, you know, Hollywood or, or Mark Andrews who are – Kind of boomer bust, um, and Lamar really ate against the Browns last last year on the ground too. Cleveland, you know, kind of everybody's darling before last season, and just you know, gonna throw it out there: the Titans smacked them in the mouth in Week One. I had to throw that one in there, uh, but I, I do expect the Browns to to be a little better this year because um, it really couldn't have got much worse. You know, Beckham is a guy who you know, I guess he's fully healthy now from his groin injury at. And you want to talk about another guy who had a major discrepancy in air yards uh, and regular yards was Beckham and, and Baker just wasn't very accurate downfield. I think he, uh, I think there was like 800 yards left on the table there for Beckham. So um, I actually have a couple of over props for uh, Beckham's yards this season. I think he'll bounce back. I'm not necessarily targeting him you know, going out of my way to play him against the Ravens. 
I think this is a little bit of a tricky game to uh, to kind of pinpoint here, you know. Pretty high over under 48 and a half, you know, and uh, I think Vegas is pretty much on the same page with some things we talked about, about a lot of teams lacking that chemistry. And, that, you know, that's – what is there, one – well, there's a Thursday night game, and then the uh, the Dallas game are the only over unders over fifty. So, yeah, really, you know, forty eight and a half is a pretty high total for this slate. So, I don't know. Where do you want to start, Lamar Jackson and the Ravens? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I obviously love Lamar. Think he's, I mean, obviously the top play, raw play on the slate. I mean. With his rushing, he just gives you such a high floor. I mean, it's almost a lock that he's going to get 60-plus rushing yards every single week. And you see him go off and get the 100-yard 100, 100 rushing bonus pretty regularly, which is – I mean, maybe not regularly, but he did it plenty of times and is more likely to hit the rushing bonus than the 300-yard passing bonus. So, love Lamar, I think, in a cash game type of thing playing a naked Lamar is is a great start if you can make it work with the rest of your lineup I guess what it comes down to there probably pretty difficult to play both Lamar and McCaffrey so you may have to to choose between the two but love Lamar you can pair him like you said with Marquise Brown or with Mark Andrews or you can play him alone I wouldn't I wouldn't ever I don't think do a double stack with Lamar just because the reason you're paying for him is, is because of the rushing. So I think trying to play Lamar Brown and Andrews is likely a mistake just because right. there's not enough to go around for all three of them. And then, like you said, I mean, Beckham is still Beckham and, and still has that upside. And at 5,900 on DraftKings, it's a very, very cheap price there. So I like him on the, the run back. Um, the running games, uh, you know, Mark, Mark Ingram, always tends to have some spike games. So I think he's one of those that that can always be a, a bit of a GPP play. But I also always felt like last year he came in at higher ownership than expected, like pretty regularly. It's like yeah. out of nowhere we see like a 20% Mark Ingram. And, you know, he's, he's very pretty touchdown dependent and obviously gets a lot taken away from just Jackson's rushing. But uh, Kareem Hunt is kind of interesting to me too, if they're going to be trailing as a yeah. like a, a, a GPP dart type of guy. And, Hunt was yeah. actually on pace for like 75 catches last year yeah. to play this full game. So I'm, I like that as a, on a full slate like this, like you'll get him at some serious low ownership. Yeah. 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 That's certainly not a, a primary target or a core play by any means, but right, of I course. think in the, the larger field stuff, putting him opposite a Lamar lineup is, is interesting. And then, yeah, I mean, I think Mark Andrews is is a solid, solid play and just a solid guy all year. I think he's kind of the, the clear third tight end behind Kelsey and Kittle and expect him to have a pretty pretty good season overall. Yeah, he, he scored three times in two games against the Browns last year, so he kind of has a knack for finding the end zone there. But you're kind of going to need him to find the end zone to hit value, I'm just I'm, I mean, he's what six k on DK, which I like. Fanduel is seventy four, which is like a little tougher for me because he's a guy who, you know, he had one one hundred yard game last year, and I guess it's not surprising when you when you think about you know how Baltimore scores and you know Lamar does it with his legs and they lean on that run game, but he's a very touchdown dependent kind of tight end. Um, yeah especially that price tag, but I get it. And it could happen. He could score twice. He, he totally could. You know, people have been exposing the you know, tight ends against the Browns have been a thing for a couple of years now. I know there's some different personnel um, and they just brought in Ronnie Harrison, but you know, they just brought in a safety like to play. So it doesn't really help things for them on the back end there. So yeah, I, I'm with you. Um, yeah. You know, naked Lamar and like naked Josh Allen. I think we got a pretty good. Yeah. I mean, Lamar just eats up so much of, Baltimore's offense yeah. that it's hard to love anyone else and like you said you know it, it's it's a guessing game of picking oh is Ingram or Andrews or Brown gonna score two touchdowns because right. that's really the only way that they're getting there so it's you know it, it's gonna be an issue every single week Baltimore is probably always gonna have a high team total but so much of that high team total is gonna be like solely Lamar based that there's there's just not you know 
there's not going to be a ton of consistency from the remaining Ravens players, but they'll always be good tournament plays because, like you said, they have that two-touchdown upside on any given week. I'm, I'm so glad we got this Manscaped promo. We got the perfect transition talking about naked Lamar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Allen. We can just jump into that Manscaped promo. Let's Go over there. It. Check out Manscaped TM once again. You know, they got some really, really good technology. Saw they uh, really increased the battery life there. 90 minutes of battery life. So if you got to do what you got to do before your roster in naked Lamar on your team before the game start, like, you know, do what you got to do. But Manscaped TM is the way to go. Man, <laughs> Man, that's pretty funny. Anyway, yeah, so obviously everybody loves Lamar. He's going to carry some significant ownership, you know, you would think. Going to be very popular in cash, right? Probably across the industry. Just because of his floor and – We've never really seen anybody you know, like him. Like a couple of years ago, would you ever consider – there was just really no scrambling quarterbacks like him since, you know, like Vic, right? Like yep. 2004 Madden Mike Vic kind of thing, and Lamar just keeps doing it. Is there any – do you have any doubts? Like is there any way that like you think the NFL can catch up to figuring out how to contain him kind of thing this year? Or is it, is it you know – first of all, the way they scheme that offense for him, incredible. Absolutely incredible. So, I mean, do you have any reservations at all with him this year? Yeah, it's a valid question. It's a valid question because now they've had a full off season to to watch the tape and prepare for how do we stop this guy. But I mean, he, he got he got better throwing the ball too, though. Yeah. So that's the that's the problem. You can't fully sell out to stop him running because now that he's got some accuracy with the arm, then then maybe he starts beating people that way. I mean. I, I really think that he's very talented and I think he's going to just create so many issues between, you know, the designed runs, the scrambling, his ability to throw the ball, some of the the downfield threats like Marquise Brown. It's something to keep an eye on, but I'm not personally terribly concerned about it. I think that he's still going to be, you know, top two quarterbacks with Mahomes this year, almost without a doubt. Right on, right on. So go ahead, you know, fire up that naked Lamar, you know, pair him with Andrews or maybe Hollywood and GPPs. Just kind of know the risk you're signing up for. Uh, probably more so even with Hollywood. Just very high ADOT guy, has to reel him in. And get on over there to manscaped.com and use your 20% off and free shipping with the promo code ROTO, ROTO, over there at manscaped.com. Let's go on here. Chargers and the Bengals. Joe Burrow, man. Joe Burrow season. AJ Green's back. And then on the Chargers side of things, no more Phillip Rivers. Tyrod Taylor is is the placeholder for Herbert, probably at some point this season, you would think. Although I do always root for Tyrod Taylor. I feel like he's just been around forever, you know, and uh another guy who could pick up some yards with his legs. But that San Diego, I'm excited for Joe Burrow. I know he's got some weapons, but that Chargers defense is is finally healthy. You know, Desmond King and uh, Chris Harris and um, who's the other corner they got there? They got a sick trio of corners that this is going to be a tough test right off the bat for for Joey B. Um, what are your just initial thoughts in this game? You know, maybe for fantasy. Obviously, Melvin Gordon's gone now, too, on the Chargers side. So, any interest here? Yeah, I think I think there's some interest here. It's, it, it's definitely a questionable situation just because two teams with brand-new quarterbacks – as you mentioned, and that, yeah, you mentioned the Chargers defense. They're they're definitely tough, and I think that they could end up being a a pretty popular play at 2,800 on DraftKings going against the rookie quarterback in his first game. Tyrod definitely pops out as a a good, cheap quarterback option, just in general. If you're looking to to save a little salary on DraftKings and get somebody under 6K, Tyrod speaks – Sticks out to me, just like you said, always brings brings a little bit of that floor and upside with the legs in this new offense. I like Eckler and Mixon, both running backs, really. I think these are other two other spots where they'll pretty much be the workhorse playing in all situations, the three down plus goal line type of backs. So I think you could you could play either of them there. And from a – yeah, Cincinnati's an interesting – offense I mean if Burrow can figure it out you got Tyler Boyd who had a breakout year last year you've got AJ Green back uh, who knows if John, I, the John Ross ship may have sailed but he's a, a speedster that I feel like 
people are done talking about him, but he was talked up for, for two or three years prior to this one. So I, I think there's some something to like there. Still got Keenan Allen on the Charger side. Uh, I don't love him as much this year without Rivers, but still someone that, that you can look to. But it's a, it's a tough, a little bit of a tough game to figure out. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the, the Carolina – Las Vegas game where my two favorite plays are probably the the two running backs on either side. Yeah, Eckler had some monster games. He's a he's yeah. a PPR machine. Um, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, they have Kelly now. I, I just I don't think he's going to immediately have a, a major role. I mean, you know, probably have a couple of carries, and and maybe by the end of the season, you know, maybe he is getting you know maybe for one reason or the other, or he's playing well, kind of gets a, a bigger role, but. Uh, they like Eckler, right? So, like, they kept him. You know, they got rid of, you know, Gordon's gone. And uh, I'm not too worried about Eckler. And, um, you know, 7K on DK, that's fair. But he's one of those guys who has, you know, serious PPR upside. And he'll probably carry the ball, you know, 10, 11, 12 times. He's not just like a James White. He's not just not going to carry the ball at all, you know, whatsoever. So, uh, I'm with you on Eckler. And I'm excited whether just in general to see Joe Burrow play at this level and, you know, just watching what he did in college goal season um, when all was right in the world over the winter. And that, that was, that was a cool time to, to see what he did. And, you know, they do have some weapons. It, that, that's going to be a fun chess match between those receivers and those uh, defensive backs of San, of San Diego, of San Diego, whatever they are, LA, <laughs> the LA Chargers. So uh, yeah, I'm with you, you know, mix in, uh, you know, another guy who a couple of weeks or months ago, people are like, well, maybe he'll hold out. It looks like that's in the past. And this guy's healthy. He he checks all the boxes. And, you know, it's week one, and you know, he seems to be, uh, you know, fairly healthy. I know he has a questionable tag from uh, – what do you have, like a, a minor – do you have like a minor issue with his head or something? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't see anything – uh, that's going to be a big red flag, but one of the few workhorses, you know, we talked about that earlier. Um, yeah. Mick Mix is one of them and um, a game where, where the game flow probably shouldn't be out of hand, right? It should be fairly competitive. I, I would think so I'm with you, with you on mixing. Yeah. And then I guess one, one more call out is Mike Williams is going to be out right for the Chargers, mm-hmm. So that'll be a, a boost to all the other charge receivers. I mean, Keenan Allen in particular, just again, condensing that target share, which is something that we're always looking for. Yeah, any um, any love for like Hunter Henry kind of thing? Uh, it's like a GPP. yeah, that, it could get a bump to him as well. Hunter Henry, let's yeah. see, he's sitting at fifty three hundred. Yeah, I think again, the, the Mike Williams thing is is pretty big on the Chargers side of it, so gives that bump to Hunter Henry as well. Fifty three hundred. He's kind of right in that uh, in a little bit of a dead zone pricing wise too I feel like at tight end people like to either go all the way up and pay up for the the Kittle or the Kelsey or go all the way down and punt it off so you probably get him at at some lower ownership and just lead you to a more contrarian build in general so I, li- I like that call for GTs yeah you know Tyrod new team new game situation maybe he'll lean on that big body kind of the security blanket over the middle in his first game as an LA Charger two more games on the main slate TJ we got a couple minutes left here uh, but we got to spend some time on this one Tampa Bay and New Orleans, 49 and a half over under. Obviously, the Bucks have made more moves than probably anyone in the world anticipated like a year ago. You know, I, I never saw Brady to Tampa coming, you know, if you would ask me a year and a half ago, right? So, I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on Tom and Tampa and Gronk's there? And they did some running back shuffling. And, and here we are, man. And people are talking about the Bucks as contenders. Yeah, it's crazy, right? It's a completely different Bucks team from from last year. You got Fournette coming in now too, so it's going to be interesting to see how all of these pieces mix and match, and they're just going to be one of the one of the more talked about teams, I imagine. Brady and Gronk back. Um, it, it should be it should be interesting, and but but I think one of the one of the things to call out is that one of the reasons that Tampa's offense was so prolific from a fantasy standpoint last year is because of the way that Jameis Winston plays and all the interceptions and pick sixes and them right. having to constantly play from behind as a result. And 
obviously Tom Brady's the complete opposite of that, right? Not, not going to see him turning the ball over a ton. So it'll probably be a, a more controlled offense, which is a, a better real life offense, but maybe leads to a slightly worse fantasy offense just because they'll be more in control of their games in general. But still, I, I think you can, you can look to, to some buck stacks. I, I would pick one of Godwin or Evans. It's always a complete toss up between the two of them. So I, I feel like I, I'd always just look to whichever one seems like they're going to be more under the radar. Look to, to pair them with, with Brady if you're looking to stack and with Kamara, obviously had the whole holdout situation that, that didn't last for very long. So I, I don't think there's any reason to be concerned about his week one workload. And I think that he certainly pops off as one of the, the best running back plays on the slate, especially in this game environment with the high total, uh, really like Kamara and uh, yeah, Gronk. I'm probably not going to look to Gronk. I just, I still question how much he's really going to be out there and what his role really is going to be, but he could, he could also just randomly get two eight yard touchdowns and and have himself a decent game. So that's, that's kind of my thoughts there. It's going to be, this is a wait and see at the, at like the tight end position. Obviously there was a lot of disappointed OJ Howard season long owners last year, because I don't know what he did. I don't know what he did to Bruce Arians or, if Bruce just – I know he doesn't use tight ends historically. You know, there's a lot of buzz about, you know, the, the slot receiver. And obviously, Godwin's a gifted, you know, player and stuff like that. But the Bucks kept O.J. Howard. We know O.J. Howard has the raw talent. But, like, they brought in Gronk, kept O.J. Howard, kept Cameron Bright. He still got Godwin and Mike Evans. So, there's a lot of mouths to feed. And as good as Tom Brady is, he's just, like, an efficiency freak at this point, right? So, he's not trying to throw the ball 40 times a game. Um, and now with Fournette, you know, and Ronald Jones, you know, we're expecting him to, to take a little bit of a leap. Uh, you know, you know, they want to run the ball, you know, establish that run game. But, you know, there's a lot of mouths to feed there now. And like you said, just the way Winston played also put that defense in horrible spots and kept them on the field a lot. So maybe their defense isn't as bad as the numbers were on paper. I mean, I'm not saying they're good, right? But like Winston put them in a lot of horrible positions to be in. Every game, every quarter last year. So, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of ways to go here. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, Brady likes the Godwin chain-moving type guy like Edelman. But also, when's the last time he had uh, a guy as physically gifted as Mike Evans to kind of throw the ball to either? So, I don't really know where the ball's going, but it's going to go up somewhere, and there's going to be fantasy points in this game. And on the other side, they got Drew Brees, who's obviously familiar with this Tampa team. I made a good point on Kamara, um, like him a lot on DK with the PPR upside there too. And we talked about um, Mike Thomas is kind of a, a no brainer. Pretty much, he's pretty much matchup proof every every week. So you're going to see a lot of stacks here, right? You're going to see a lot of green blips on FanDuel in the back, and then they're you know if this game really lives up to the hype, there's a chance that there's a lot of late pushes on Sunday with. Uh, this Tampa and New Orleans game here. I guess gun to head, do you favor either Godwin or Evans or like is it site dependent or, you know, what 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 do you do mm-hmm. there, TJ? Yeah. Oh, it's so close. I yeah. I kind of prefer Godwin, I would say. Um it, it, se- it seems like they it seems like one thing is that they kind of tend to alternate, right? Like I don't I wouldn't play them together essentially. I would pick one of them in any given lineup versus trying to double stack. But I've generally tended towards Godwin and like in season long and stuff and and taking Godwin over Evans, but it's super, super close. And like you said, I think there's 100% going to be scoring in this game and it'll be a a popular game stack. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can stack it up, which I think makes it interesting. And I don't think that ownership will condense too heavily on, on any individuals outside of Kamara. But other than that, I think, Things should be pretty spread out, and you can get creative with this one. Agreed. Moving on, one more game here. Arizona and San Francisco. Kyler Murray got DeAndre Hopkins this offseason. They are going to be fun. You know, they might not win the most games, but they're going to throw the ball. They're going to spread it out. We know Murray has super upside. He's 
probably one of my personal favorite quarterbacks to watch play in the league right now. But he's got a tough divisional matchup right off the bat here with the Niners, you know, coming off that Super Bowl loss where, you know, they were in control for a while. And, uh, but here we are in 2020 and, you know, is a lot of people are probably questioning Jimmy Garoppolo and if he's the guy and, you know, looking at that backfield, you got Jarek McKinnon, who's healthy and, you know, is Mostert going to get touches and Tevin Coleman still there. We covered like six or seven backfields that there's just so many question marks this year, which kind of makes, uh, makes, it gives you even more incentive to kind of pay up for like a McCaffrey on week one. Right. So yeah. I guess just what are your first thoughts here? You know, either side of the ball, go ahead. Yeah. The, the, the Niners are a tough one because they, they just spread outside of Kittle. They spread it around so much, right? Like they, they love to run the ball, but they don't have one workhorse. They're, they're going to mix in a couple different guys. Uh, so, I mean, first thought, I think Kittle is of course a great play. I think, especially on on FanDuel, it often makes sense to to pay up at tight end. He's a little bit expensive at 8K, but but I think he kind of makes sense for some FanDuel builds. And then I think on DraftKings as well, it's a great tournament strategy to pay up at tight end just because generally speaking, that's where people look to save salary. So I like Kittle for sure against this Arizona team. I like, like Garoppolo a little bit as well he doesn't he tends to not have that many massive massive games though just because of the way they like to run the ball so I don't think he's like a slam dunk play but but I do think that he's a solid one and in terms of the San Francisco wide receivers it's a little bit tough to pinpoint Uh, you've got a I don't even know how to say Ayuk Ayuk is that how we say his name yeah you got rookie coming in there so he's, he's an interesting option. You've got Kendrick Bourne, who, who sort of emerged toward the end down the stretch last season. But like I said, they, outside of Kittle, they, they tend to spread the ball around a bit. So he's where I'd place the majority of my focus on the, the San Francisco side of things. No, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I'm curious to see how quickly uh, Kyler and Hopkins kind of click. Um, on FanDuel, Hopkins is 7,800, so he's like a pivot off of that Godwin, Mike Evans, you know, if you're not stacking that game, kind of they're right there. Um, kind of going to – I'm going to take a wait-and-see approach, I think, you know, to see what's going on there. You know, they still have Fitzgerald. You know, a lot of people are saying Andy Isabella's going to step up. You know, Christian Kirk's still there. Uh, it's a little – there's more mouths to feed there than in Houston when it was him and Will Fuller was inactive every other game and – that was pretty much it. Um, who knows what we're going to get with Kenyon Drake? Do you have any read on that situation at all? And that, you know, just for this season in general, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, all signs point towards the expectation that he's going to be the workhorse for them. It, but he's never, but he's also never done that before, right? So it's yeah. it's going to be an interesting one to monitor. They also have Chase Edmonds, who I know a lot of people are pretty high on just from a, a talent perspective. He's a, a popular kind of late season long best ball flyer that, that people like if, if the Drake thing doesn't pan out, but I, I like Kenyon Drake in general. Now this is not the best matchup, obviously going up against San Francisco. It'll be interesting to see his involvement in the passing game, because if he's, if he's going to be getting a lot of check downs in a game script where they're behind, then maybe He's one of those people who's game script independent and you can play him even when they are a big underdog and 6,400 is a pretty fair price for him. So he's someone that's interesting to me and maybe more of a, of a GPP type of play, but definitely a situation to keep an eye on. And I'm curious to see how much run Chase Edmonds gets or if it's truly the, the Kenyon Drake show in Arizona. Yeah, I'm with you. I like Kittle in that game. I'll probably just maybe if a one-off kind of fits in my, you know, main optimal builds or something, then I'll I'll be okay with it. Um, But definitely going to be a wait and see here. I want to see what this Hopkins connection is all about. You know, uh, maybe, you know, Kenny Drake's not my first or second option, but you know he has upside for sure. Tough matchup though, you know, right off the gate for him. So we'll see what happens there. But in terms of just football, we have some really good four o'clock football games on Sunday. So it's about time. I, I can't wait, TJ. It's, uh, I know we got to get out of here soon, but uh, 
is there anything else on this main slate you wanted to bring up? Any, you know, any other favorite plays or anything we missed? I think we covered most of it. And yeah, yeah like, like we said before, good, good week to go a little bit contrarian. If you have a, a take that's maybe not in line with what everyone else is talking about and what everyone else is doing, now's the time to take your stand on that and, and try to make some profit off of it. And I would say also just take some of your, your season long best ball type of thoughts and takeaways and, and apply those to week one good opportunity to, to use the guys that you've been high on from a long-term perspective and see if it pays off in that first week. But like you said, I'm excited to sit on my couch, watch some red zone on Sunday, and hopefully see some, some green screens in our DFS lineups. Absolutely, TJ. I know we're a little over our hour probably, but we covered a lot of ground here. Really quick, Will Priester and myself had this tradition that that the Discord people and the premium member love our GPP food of the day. We talked about food and people loved it. They didn't care about our, our analysis. So what, what's your go-to week one? You know, what kind of food are you making? Are you ordering? And, you know, what are you washed it down with over there? Oh, great question. So week one, probably order some pizza. I feel like that feels like the go-to here and definitely be, be throwing back some, some beers over here as well. As soon as that, Lineup lock hits at one o'clock, order a pizza, throw back some beers. That'll, that'll be my week one go-to. How about yourself? Yeah, pizza and beer sounds good. Maybe, maybe some wings. Maybe I'll go with the wings, you know. Um, in, in the middle of nowhere here in Pennsylvania, wing, like wings and like wing nights are like, uh, like an event, like a, a weekly like event here. So people don't really have much to do, and they take their like hot wing and buffalo wing uh, making pretty serious out here. So you're going to do some wings, some pizza, and get a couple cold ones, depending on how the how the 1 o'clock games are shaping out. And, uh, you know, give us a like, subscription, give us some feedback. Hopefully some of this you know, helps you guys start your research for the week. And, uh, you know, we'll be looking forward to being here with you guys throughout the rest of the 2020 season. TJ, where can the people find you on Twitter? You guys can find me on Twitter at TJL5124DFS. Give me a follow there. And uh, yeah, TJL5124. Your screen name across the various sites. And good luck to everyone. Like Justin said, looking forward to doing this on a weekly basis going forward. All right. So for TJ Lasig, I'm Justin Carlucci. Have fun and good luck in week one.